There is a, a critical issue in relation to the MOT situation, and it would be remiss of the committee not to spend a little bit of time before we go into general questions, just to, in relation to that. I suppose, really, at, at lunchtime yesterday, we had a statement from the Minister, which was giving the impression that the situation was obviously in hand. Um, by early evening, we had Paul Duffy then cancelling all the MOTs, so it escalated quite quite quickly um, during the course of the day. Uh, this morning, he's saying that this could take weeks, if not months, to resolve the situation. You may then have to replace all the lifts at, a, at a, obviously a quite, a, quite a cost to, I'm imagining, the, the public purse, although perhaps you might want to give clarification in relation to that, particularly in a time when we are under quite severe budget constraints. Um, and it's, a, it's something, obviously, which is unforeseen too. Um, that said, can you maybe give us some more information about how we find ourselves in what has turned out to be quite a symbolic situation and where we move on from here? Yes, happy to do that, uh, Chair. Um, maybe that's the place to start in terms of the, the lead into this and just to, to be clear how this has happened. Uh, and obviously then just picking up the very recent developments of yesterday evening, I'm happy to also talk about those. <coughs> Um, this is not a situation obviously anybody wants to, to find themselves in at all and we're particularly concerned about the disruption uh, for our customers and what it means for them and I'll touch on that as well. In terms of um, the, the general issues, um, all the lifts within DBA are inspected and monitored on an ongoing basis. Minor inspections every eight weeks and major inspections every six months on the lifts within our uh, centres. So going back into last year, uh, the sixth monthly inspections were started um, in July and those were running through and went through till November. By that stage, nine MOT centres had had clean bills of health and no cracks had been lodged by the, or, uh, by the supplier um, on those lifts. The tenth centre, which was Lauren Test Centre, the supplier identified cracks, that was in November. But had no concerns about the safety of the lift um, and set off to then test the, uh, and go through the continue doing those inspections through the remaining five centres. That work continued uh, through to January um, and on the 15th of January it was at that point that we got the report that said that there were signs of cracking to varying degrees and those cracks are at varying degrees. Some of them are, are particularly wide and others are, 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 are much more narrower. So cracks to varying degrees on 48 of the 55 lifts that are in operation. Again, however, no safety concerns being logged at that point. DBA then asked for a full uh, inspection uh, to be carried out of all the lifts, going back over the ones that have been given, if you like, the clean bill of health earlier in the process. And following that, um, and further inspections of lifts on the 22nd of January, uh, that was when effectively that we took the precautionary <coughs> step to take the lifts down until they had been inspected, repaired, and re-inspected. Now, all the way through this, each of those lifts, we've been working with suppliers, we've been in cl clarifying with them what the position is on each lift, um, and ensuring that, that the safety of the customers and of the staff was given priority. So that was the process and that was where we were. You know that Minister then was obviously very concerned about that and acted very quickly. Um, and as of uh, Friday and then coming into the weekend, we put in place the temporary exemption certificates, uh, which effectively is giving four months extra on an MOT certificate to all cars and light vehicles apart from those who are four years old. Um, because there's no MOT certificate to actually extend for those, and taxis because they operate under different legislation. And we were also taking steps to prioritise those. And that was the position as where we were uh, coming into yesterday morning and into the afternoon. Yesterday afternoon then, uh, through a meeting with the supplier, uh, they were not able to give us sufficient assurances about the effectiveness of the repairs that have been put into place. And on hearing that, um, the DBA had obviously no option and uh, absolutely took the right step to suspend the testing under those lifts um, until the issue is resolved. Uh, testing on heavy goods vehicles and on buses obviously continues for now. Um, the, we are also trying to prioritise and obviously very concerned about taxis and buses, sorry, taxis and four year old cars. Um, and we're seeking to put those through. What's happening within each MOT centre, there is still a heavy duty lane that is working. It does not use the lifts. It is not affected by this at all. Um, and we're seeking to put taxis and four-year-old cars through that 
uh, alongside the heavy duty um, vehicles that need to go through there too. Um, obviously then communications to customers and to staff has been a, a key priority as well and we have been and that's why there have been several engagements and, and, and lots of media and, and statements being made on this <coughs> through uh, from the, the middle of last week through to yesterday. We will continue to update people today. We appreciate certainly in, in last week's situation each thing was each lift was being looked at. It was a very fluid situation and that led to um, some customers turning up when actually the MOT ended up then being cancelled. Um, so um, that fluidity, I guess, is not so much an issue now, because what we're saying is don't turn up uh, for your appointment. Uh, we will contact directly uh, customers with taxis and four-year-old cars to bring them in. So it's a much clearer message, I think, for the public, because it is less fluid now in terms of where we're at. We're obviously then looking at the uh, <coughs> whole position about, well, how do we move this forward then and, and fix it and get it resolved? Um, as far as that is concerned, um, <coughs> what we're doing is looking to see what the status of each of those lifts are. Um, we will then be looking about, uh, uh, is the answer to this about replacing parts, about replacing whole lifts, and how do we deal with that? Um, and that's been done as a matter of urgency. Um, the issue around that, and that's a whole lot of work, I guess, that needs to, to be looked for uh, in that. Um, and we are, you know, those options just basically need to be worked through to, to, to determine both what we need to do and in what time frame. But it's, it's been given, obviously, <coughs> full urgency. The minister has called urgent meetings and has uh, um, obviously put the, the notes around executive colleagues to yourselves. Uh, did the ministerial statement, which was factually correct at the point in time we were at yesterday, um, and obviously position then moved on considerably yesterday evening. She called a meeting yesterday evening, and she's calling another one today. So um, we are moving very quickly to uh, the issue, and we obviously fully apologise to all the customers um, that have been affected by it. And we are trying to prioritise the right vehicles so that the ones that have the problems are, are um, uh, as in that they can't get the extensions, are the ones that are given priority within the centres. In terms of standing back from it and saying, well, how did we get here? Um, and, you know, um, how did this arise? When you're in a position whereby this has never happened before, uh, the cracks have not been identified. Um, this is very, very fluid, very recent. Um, and therefore, we're in a position now where we're dealing with that position. We are obviously talking to the supplier, to the inspectors, to the repairs people. All of that is, is all in train, um, and it's, it, you know that is a, a situation that moves almost on, on a daily basis. So there are many trains that we are 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 making sure that we have in hand here, from um, communications to supplier management to talking to uh, our staff and ensuring. And, but the priority and the, real, the reason for all of this is the health and safety of our staff and customers. There was no choice in the action. That's why it, um, the, the step was taken last night. Um, and we have to respond to that health and safety first and foremost. Unfortunately, that is leading to disruption. And it's leading to, obviously, then the work that we need to do in order to get this rectified and get it rectified very urgently. Okay, and I absolutely agree in relation to the issue around health and safety, and it's much better that we're in this situation having this discussion now than had something very serious happened and that we were looking backwards rather than um, trying to, to put in place measures um, which would enhance safety. Can I just ask how old the lifts actually are? <clears throat> The majority lifts are from 2011-2012, so what's that, um, eight, nine years old. And are inspections carried in-house or are they carried out externally? Um, is it manufacturer linked? Can you maybe explain so that So it's a contract with the manufacturer um, and then there's a subcontract on the uh, inspecting and on the repairs regime. Those are both subcontracted out. Um, we are obviously looking at one of the options about getting an, in, uh, an independent assessment again on the lifts um, and doing that through a separate route and that is likely to be one of the angles that we, are, we will put in place very quickly. And is it considered that the, in, in the first instance that the lifts were actually fit for the purpose in which they've been used? Given that we had got no, no sign of anything and no concerns, safety concerns <coughs> being raised by those suppliers, uh, then you know this has literally come out of the blue from a, a, 
a record that doesn't show any cracks within the system and certainly has not logged those as being immediate safety concerns. So the start of this and the first cracks that are logged as, um, are from November. Uh, but even at that, there was no concerns raised at that point. And it's then the trail that goes through to uh, the 15th of January, whereby we um, learn more about the extent of those cracks, where DBA asked for, understandably, asked for more inspections to be carried out. <coughs> and in, in all of that, then leads to the 22nd of January around um, the, the first kind of uh, step in, and then the step in of last night. Well, there has been an increase in the usage of the lifts over the last number of years with the number of vehicles, increased number of vehicles on the road. And obviously you have admitted that there is a capacity issue anyway with regard to MOT centres. So I'm sort of mindful of that, that you're putting additional pressure onto, onto lifts on a daily basis that perhaps weren't, wasn't anticipated at the time of installation and really then goes back to asking the question whether they're now fit for purpose for what we need now. Yeah, and I guess that, that issue, and if we, if we look to what we need in the future, we will obviously be taking those demand issues in, into account. Um, but, you know, the, the regime of having those checks in place, the eight weekly, the six monthly, in terms of making sure they were checked, we had put in place, and what, we, what they had been working through up until yesterday was a, a, a programme of... Uh, inspecting, repairing, reinspecting, and we'd also put in a two-week reinspection as well to confirm that things were okay. You know, we're, we're still operating okay. Um, that, based on what we knew at the time, was um, was you know what we needed to do, um, and it has really only come out in in the very recent. You know, certainly last night, in terms of the change of last night, and then in the last few days uh, prior to that, that you know things needed to be looked at more clearly. We will we will need to step back uh, on lots and lots of this. A minister has asked for a review um, of how did we get here, the contingency planning, our communications to the public. Um, she obviously had asked for the temporary exemption certificates to be put in place. Uh, there's a step back needed about how we procure, what we procure. All of that will need to be looked at. How we set up our maintenance contracts. We will have to have discussions with the supplier about the current situation um, and what, if anything, we can do via them with that in a contractual manner. And that, that was also another part of, of what we need to do. So there's lots of angles on this. Priority health and safety first and foremost. Secondly, get communications out to the public. Thirdly, make sure that the public know and that we are giving them the protection that they need through the temporary exemption certificates and then working with the taxis and the four-year-old cars. And fourthly, working then with the getting understanding on the lift side of things and where we go. That's been the order of where we have been at. Um, in very, very short time in terms of how this has all uh, transpired. And there have been discussions on, on the broader media in relation to dealing with the capacity and perhaps whether or not you need to look at a different method of testing or, in fact, look at the, the year in which a car should then start to be tested, given, obviously, the improvement in, in motor vehicles over the last number of years. Yes, and I think those are all you know, those are broader questions, aren't they? And probably not one for certainly not one for me for today. Um, you know, in terms of you know, we need to make sure that absolutely what we're providing is a is a fit for purpose service. Today it is not, um, and therefore we need to take steps to make that a more effective service in the future. Okay, quite a number of members have indicated, um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks very much for for some of the answers. Um, I do agree with. You. You, customer, I know people who've never been to MOT Centre. I mean, customer safety is an issue, mm -hmm. and, and whether or not there was a collapse of a lift, according to some reports, I mean, you don't sit that far away from it if you're in a test centre, especially our mile one. I know, I know for experience. So, worker and customer safety is a major issue. But I just want to go back to the procurement because it's going to be a major part to play in the future. I mean, all of a sudden, all, like I take it, all of these lifts didn't go at the same time. Or did the go um, Not all of them, but a significant number of them did. Right, I, because it mean, was mean all of a sudden now they've all failed. I mean, and I agree the chair said that the increase in the number of vehicles being tested would certainly lead that. But, <coughs> but I do welcome the point that you mentioned procurement because there's, there's certain questions asked. And, and the issue for us is then, in part of the procurement process and the contracts, uh, there needs to be checks and balances as to how that's all carried out. Because, I mean, it seems to me come November, bang, and everything's happened, and it's all out over the media. We're 
We are getting the stories to the press and appreciate the Minister has tried to respond to some of the questions that we brought up. Um, yeah, the procurement staff, and, and I would I want the, the, you know, to take on board those comments. <coughs> the other issue, as you mentioned there, about now you're going to put the other cars through one of the lanes. Mm -hmm. What equipment's on those, on those lanes, on the lorry lanes? On the lorry lanes, there's not a lift involved. There's effectively a pit, so it's, it's right. driven over the top of the pit, so there, the, there's <coughs> no lift involved in it, uh, and therefore it's a completely different system to, as you, as you say, from a okay. MOT where the car goes yeah. up into the air. And, and the point is, but I take it then, how then do you do the exact same checks? So there's rollers, obviously, for, for breaking those, but in terms of the hydraulic lift on the lift itself, the chest, the joints and all of that, I'm just... I'm getting technical here, but I know it. I mean, you know, there's enough. I'm hearing from constituents now, there's loads of people out there who book tests. <coughs> you're saying you're going to put them all through one lane. That's going to take a considerable period of time. We would always, this is nothing new, that you put cars onto the heavy duty lane. Obviously, the priority and the normality would have been that buses and heavy uh, goods vehicles go onto those lanes. However, cars have been routinely um, tested on those heavy, heavy uh, duty lanes. And to the Chair's point, given the capacity issues and the volume and the demands, we've been using those lanes flexibly to enable cars to be looked at. So that's normal practice, and, and the, the centres are well geared to testing cars, and they can obviously test them on those lanes. Um, properly. So, so there's no change in the test itself? Like the test right. itself will be the same test um, and therefore and it will operate, there will be many people who will have had their cars tested already uh, in routine procedure <coughs> on those heavy duty lanes. In, in terms of the certificate, I mean there's a lot of questions being asked now whether the cars are roadworthy, whether they need to be taxed, the issue of insurance. Uh, can you explain how we're going to get through all of that? or? explain how we're going to go to the public and communicate that message and whether they're legally uh, qualified to drive on the road or not, whether the road car is roadworthy. Okay, there's there's several layers to that. Um, all owners, are it is their responsibility to ensure that your car is roadworthy at all times. Um, we all know an MOT is done at a point in time um, and then something can break down, a light might break or something <coughs> like that. It's, it's all of our responsibilities to ensure our cars are roadworthy on an ongoing basis. The MOT certificate is then given out on an annual basis in support of that. Um, the temporary exemption certificates that we have put in place and which have been either backdated from, from Monday the 20th of January if they needed to be or are being put in on a daily basis as MOTs, existing MOTs expire. So they are able to pick up from our systems when an MOT is expiring. You need to have booked your car in for a test and have that <coughs> test cancelled by the DBA for us to pick it up uh, from our system. So we know that you've booked in a, a, an appointment that, you, that, that we, as in DBA, have cancelled that appointment. We will pick that up in the system within the offices and go into the back office system, if you like, and give that extension, that four-month extension, in the back office system. That is legal from the minute that it changes on our back office systems. Uh, a customer may, may not get their actual letter confirming that, because that's obviously an administrative process that has to go through for maybe a week or ten days. But as soon as those processes are done in the MOT centre, that will be legally changed. There is then an automatic overnight on that into the DVLA systems where the tax is picked up. So they can automatically see that your tax has, uh, sorry, your MOT certificate is now at a different date, four months hence, and therefore the tax is, is able to operate off the back of that extended temporary exemption certificate. And if those are in place, then that should allow an insurance provider to equally confirm that you're legally insured to drive. Now, there's a lot of steps in that, and I appreciate that. Um, and people may wish to contact their insurance provider and confirm that they are comfortable and, and what, with all of that. But our understanding is that as the very act of putting that temporary exemption certificate in place is extending that MOT to a different date. All the systems that talk to each other in the background, including the tax one, know that that has been put in at the extra four month date. Um, and the insurance, therefore, should be legal pr provided. <coughs> I believe you need your insurance and other things like that that are your own responsibility. So all of that, if you like, for those vehicles, bar the taxis and four-year-old cars, we have used this system before. It's some years now since we did it, but we have done it before. 
um, and therefore those are the checks and balances that are applying in, in the background for it. I appreciate that that is quite complicated for everybody to understand and um, there is a lot for people to digest in this and we, we, we recognise that, that communication is one of, the, one of the issues around this, ensuring obviously that media, NI Direct, uh, social media, all of these things are picking up the right messages um, um, and insurance providers may be asking questions and it's understandable maybe that they do, um, um, but our, our understanding is it uh, will definitely resolve the tax issue automatically, system by system. The customer does not need to do anything. As long as they have actually booked an appointment with the DVA and had that appointment cancelled, then the system will pick it up. If you don't make an appointment in the first place, <coughs> then blatantly uh, nothing will. So we are still encouraging, and we still encourage today, people to uh, book their appointments. So when those reminder letters are going out to people, they should still be booking appointments um, because only through the cancellation of those appointments are we then picking them up and, and fixing them in the system at the time when their MOT expires. But somebody tell you to book an appointment last night and couldn't get on the system, wouldn't accept it. Is it? Can you book an appointment online? My understanding is yes, but we can definitely get that clarified. It needs yeah. And ju just uh, one quick point, Chair, I know everybody has questions there. The uh, issue, it's, it's reported now it's going to take a certain amount of money to fix all of this. Um, have you any indication of what that is? And I, I asked the question in the context of yesterday, there was a monitoring round in the Chamber. We have known now for a number of days, we may not have known the amount, but now we're going to, because it will come back to this committee to support a bid to get some monies to, to replace <coughs> all of these. Um, was there any discussions in relation to that? The, uh, the in terms of, the, the, of the financing of it, obviously you're absolutely right, it's very, very early early doors in terms of uh, up until last night the lifts were being repaired and fixed and whatever and, and the purchasing them urgently was not uh, part of the um, where we thought we were. In terms of um, how it would be funded, um, DBA has like a trading fund where it operates as an agency, so it's part of the department. They are departmental staff, but it operates as a, as a trading fund, uh, and therefore the first place that any funds and any costs of this sort of nature come from is from that DBA trading trading fund. Now it's still public funds and still needs to be absolutely uh, looked after and used appropriately, but it would not be a call on, um, nor would we be bidding for it into the in-year monitoring process. It's a matter that DBA can resolve and have the reserves to resolve, um, but it's still obviously a significant amount of money uh, and something that we need to make sure we're, we're spending appropriately and wisely. Just on that point, can I, are you aware of what reserves DBA have at this mm. stage? Um, I. Mm, I think I am, but I, I'm kind of reluctant to give a number. Uh, but it's certainly well sufficient to deal with to deal with this. Yeah, that might be something we we'll speak to Paul Duffy whenever he comes yes, to committee okay. then next week. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, just a, on just a quick wee mention. <laughs> certainly, in the issue of procurement contract, is a vitally important one for us. Mm -hmm. That needs to be open and transparent, and the, the checks and balances need to be put into place to make sure that doesn't happen again. But I've loads of questions, but I'll let all our members do. Uh, we we all do. Okay. Um, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Thompson, just a question. I'm going to pick up on the whole maintenance regime. It's a bit of a former background of mine. So, you see, on the eight week check, obviously that's every eight, week, eight, eight weeks. Yes. Is that by uh, an outsourced company? Yes, the supplier um, outsourced uh, subcontracts, the uh, inspector and the uh, and also the repairing function from so the is supplier. So is your contract with the supplier who then sub... Absolutely, our contract with the supplier who then subcontracts. Right, so the contract, okay. And is that one subcontractor? Across Northern Ireland? Uh, no, um, yes, one, co uh, one subcontract across Northern Ireland for the inspection, as I understand it, and one subcontract for the repairs. Okay, so the subcontractor does the eight week check? Yes. Okay, the six month check, who does that? The same subcontractor, as I understand it. Right. Do you see from a, a Lawler lift and regulation point of view, do you get in, you, you, in my previous life, you do your own maintenance regime? or you, 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 you farm it out as such, but you also get your insurance company then inspect the equipment to, to clarify them who are insuring you 
Uh, I'm not sure what way it works for yourselves, but certainly in the private end itself is the case. So does any insurance company inspect that, or is it only the one supplier does all the inspection, or a subcontractor inspection? The subcontracting and inspecting uh, inspector is through an insurance company. So that's an insurance company that is doing that inspecting, okay. reporting to the supplier, who then reports okay. to us. So it's an insurance inspector every yes. eight weeks? Okay. Yeah. So was these... Issues picked up on the six months check, which is obviously more more of an inspection regime than an eight week check, because an eight week would be a general <coughs> check. So were they picked up with the six month check or the eight week check? The original uh, issue from November is a six month check, and there was a series of six month checks going on through all the MOT centres at that point. And is that a, a <coughs> maybe is that a, an hour check? Is that a day check? What, what's the period of time roughly in that six month check? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I wouldn't know the, right. the, the language. But obviously it's more, it's more in depth. It's more in depth, okay. absolutely. You see the fault that's picked up then? Was that a, you're talking about the crack, is that a stress crack, a fracture crack? Do you know the detail of that, what that is? I know it's cracks of very, it's in the scissor arms of the, of the lift. Okay. Uh, I know the cracks have varied certainly in their size. Uh, in terms of the, the exact kind of technical uh, explanation of that crack, I wouldn't be the, the person to be able to answer that. So, so the manufacturer, is that a UK manufacturer or a European manufacturer or where they manufactured the lifts? Um, they're Irish based and they're a leading supplier of lifts. So had they any other faults across, I presume they're a world supplier, are they? Uh, yes, they're a world supplier. So is this the first faults they have picked up in Northern Ireland? We are not aware of, of anything of this nature and certainly not in our, on our record. We are absolutely still in very early doors conversations with the supplier and this gets into that sort of territory in terms of what has happened here, uh, the quality of what they have been doing, uh, how they have been getting their assurances, what does that mean about lifts in general. Um, so a lot of those conversations are still in the happening um, and therefore I, you know, they, they need to be followed through. We will follow them through with the supplier. So Absolutely. as of today, is there a solution apart from replacing a lift? Is there a, a part that can be replaced? We are having conversations, there are several conversations are going in terms of options. Uh, we are looking at parts, we're looking at lifts and we're looking about a second opinion on the uh, inspector to see whether another opinion would bring the same issues in terms of safety and whether those are brought through from a separate and secondary and is, is level a, I know it's very early but is there a timeline of all that, Julie, in regard to getting parts? You know, because if this was identified in November, that supplier could say, well, it's that part, it's that fracture, we can replace it or we can't. We're now a bit better packed in February. Yeah, and, and when, when I say November, that was when the first sign of the cracks were reported. It's only in January, uh, 15th of January, that it becomes 48 lifts out of uh, the 55. Uh, and then only last uh, Wednesday, uh, 22nd of January, where it becomes a more serious issue. Up until that point, <coughs> Um, we have um, a very isolated, or what looks like an isolated in incident in November, uh, then becoming a more widespread incident. We think we have put in place an inspection, repair, reinspection regime. Two weeks extra inspections going on in place, and it's only then last night where the assurances are not able to be given to us by the supplier that led to the decisions of last night. It is a really fluid position. <coughs> One, I would suggest that everybody is struggling to understand how does this happen out of the blue. Uh, and we need to follow the trail with the supplier about all of that, with the inspector as well, and the repairs. Um, and then leading from that about our options about what do we do next in terms of procurement and whatever. So uh, whilst priority has absolutely been given, and rightly so, to um, health and safety and also to customer impact, we are also working with the supplier um, to understand what is going on. That's part of our Minister's review is how did this happen um, and what is the learning and how do we avoid this happening again. Okay, uh, just on the, mention the number of lifts, did you say 55 in total? 55 in total. And how many uh, faults identified with? Um, in, on, on the 15th of January there was 48 uh, identified. Uh, we had 21 up and running yesterday. Um, um, and obviously as of today, none. So can, are you not at a position to use the seven that there's no issues with? Or are you just... We have decided, uh, as a precautionary measure, that we should take them all down. 
they may come to a view that actually some and this rain, if we can get a second opinion, a reinspection or whatever, we may be able to bring some of them up. But we took the decision last night that it was safer and better to take them all down. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and I don't envy your position. Uh, certainly, there's a, a lot of work in relation to confidence and trust with the public at this stage, and difficulties with communications as well. I know this morning we've sort of covered tax insurance, but the enforcement as well as to how that's all going to play out uh, to those affected. Uh, could you tell us, Julia, if there's a was there a case that there were some welding repairs carried out? Would that be accurate to say that as well at some stage? Uh, yes, the repairs were we are welding repairs. That's um, as the cracks cracks were identified, the welding was going in to to fix the repair. Um, so yes, that is a that is true. Um, oh, was it no. uh, but they were then being reinspected before they were being brought back into. Uh, so as of even last, you know, during the tail end of last week, welding was going on. <coughs> this were being reinspected and they were being brought into use. As of last night, the supplier wasn't able to give us sufficient assurance about the quality of those repairs, and hence the decision. Oh. But welding is absolutely part of uh, of, of fixing it. Okay, and uh, Mr. Boyden touched upon the uh, the danger to the public at some of these centres, but I would like to touch upon the issue of the employees affected. Uh, how he's working with the employees, who I'm sure their confidence and trust at this stage is very low, having potentially had to work in that scenario. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Um, so working with employees, obviously, it has been a very very fluid position. So making sure that everybody's up to date. Um, we know at times that has been a, a, a difficulty and a challenge to us. Um, having said that, uh, we have been operating through those test centre managers and our deputy test centre managers if they're, if they're there. A lot of it has to be done verbally because you know, they're, they're not sitting at computers and, and looking at uh, they're, they're in test centres. So a lot of the communications are verbal communications. We've obviously been working with trade union side uh, and keeping them very much in the loop in terms of what this looks like, as they would be anyway on the health, health and safety regime generally across DBA, but certainly in the last few days. Um, they are the ones, um, both in terms of being under the lifts, but also in terms of dealing with the, uh, the angry customers who are coming up and who uh, are not happy that their, their appointment is not being scheduled. So we absolutely uh, need to ensure we're communicating. I am, uh, you know, we will continue to take steps to do that. I'm sure we will need to do more in that space um, in order to ensure we get the messages out. Um, and staff at times, I'm sure, are not fully aware of what actually has been happening. That may be because of the, and is likely to be because of the pace at which some of this has actually moved, but we are doing our utmost um, to ensure that staff are kept apprised as the, as the position moves, but it's moving, it has moved so fast that um, at times that is obviously a challenge to us. But you're absolutely right there. Safety and that of the public around the lifts is absolute priority. And it's, it's led to us taking the precautionary step, including taking out some lifts and taking them down, even though we're not, there's nothing actually wrong with them as we understand it at this point. We're just taking it uh, Away that way. Is it accurate then that staff were actually in danger? No, in that you know where where lifts were being brought back in, they had been given uh, by those inspectors, reinspected and told that they could come back into operation. So we were only bringing them back into operation. That's why there was only 21 lifts operating yesterday, because only 21 of them had that um, had that bill of health. As of last night, then, the supplier confirmed that they couldn't give sufficient insurances based on the further work that they had done, and that led us to say, well, if you can't, then the whole lot's coming down. So, but every lift had been given, that we reopened, had been given, or had been reinspected, and they, we were told was okay to open. Now, that's obviously something that we are very concerned about. Um, and we will follow up with the supplier and the inspector. It's another avenue of, of questioning that we will need to be doing with them. Okay, I think there's more to develop on that, but not with yourself today, obviously. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks for the update. Just can you clarify from what you've said? My understanding is someone who had applied for an MOT and it's been rejected, they can go on to DVA in Swansea and get taxed if they're 
uh, if they've got this four month extension. Is that operational now? So um, they actually don't need to do anything. Um, if, you, if you have a, a, an appointment with DBA and the DBA cancel that appointment, okay? And then the day that your MOT, so we're doing it obviously on a, on a day by day basis, um, on the day that that MOT is due to expire, the staff in the centres, and we had them all working over the weekend to keep this moving to ensure we were operational in this, um, the staff in the centres are then processing the system, our system, DBA system, to issue the temporary exemption certificate to give that four month extension to all the cars and light vehicles apart from taxis and four year old cars. Our systems back up automatically overnight into the DVLA system which is the tax system and they will automatically pick up in DVLA that that MOT date that used to say January is now saying April or May or whatever the date may be. So, so that's happening automatically in the background. You won't, we won't be able to get the customers the actual hard copy, the proof of that, if you want to, to put it like that, until we can process those and get the letters out and all of that, which will take a week to 10 days. But from the, the minute and the day that, that we put it into the system, on our system, overnight, all of those are backed up into the tax system. And that is an automatic thing that the, um, the customer doesn't need to, you know, do, do anything to make happen. You say they just need to go to the post office and tax their cars then? They are, or go on, a lot of this is done online. Okay. Okay. So that's where the advantage of the online. Uh, what, I, what I can't answer for you is if you're looking to have a, you know, a paper copy, your paper copy is going to be the wrong one and the, with the wrong date. Um, but online, the way the online systems work, uh, which most people do use these days, um, they will pick it up automatically and you don't need your hard copy anymore in the way that you would have used to. Okay. Um, so, but anybody who's trying to do it hard copy will, will have a different issue, I, I suspect. But uh, yeah. online will work. In terms of the current capacity, just using the heavy goods vehicle uh, testing line, you know, I'm just I'm familiar with Lars, where I go to MOT, and um, there'll be two light vehicles uh, lines and one heavy goods vehicle. So my estimation from that, you will be down to a third, a quarter capacity. What capacity currently exists? Yeah, that, that is the normal kind of relationship <coughs> between the lanes in each, in each test centre. Some of them are bigger, like Newton Arts yeah. is, is considerably bigger. In terms of the capacity issue and can we get all the taxis and four-year-old cars through, which is uh, the, the important issue, um, we are looking at that, and that was um, that may have all been looked at while I've been sitting here. Um, um, in that we are looking at today's taxis and today's four-year-old cars that needed to be pulled through, and getting getting in contact with those customers to try and bring them through. The heavy duty lane normally stops at five o'clock. Uh, and we're obviously uh, looking to extend that into the evening um, in that the MOT centres generally are open into the evening but normally the heavy duty one will stop and the other light ones will continue. So we do have extra capacity there that we can automatically bring in um, because we will have both the staff and the availability of, of, of appointments within each centre to, to fill bookings each evening. But we, we need to fill them with the right cars so rather than people turning up to those, we will be contacting the customers to arrange those appointments with them for the cars and the taxis that need them to be prioritised, putting everybody else into the temporary exemption category. Last summer when there was quite a, a backlog, uh, I myself was looking at Enniskill and Armagh, Coleraine at one stage just yeah. to get my own, my own car. Uh, through the MOT, uh, so you know, people can be people can be will will actually uh, accept inconvenience in order to get their vehicle on the road. So, to what extent are you extending the shift system so that as many opportunities as uh, as possible will be available? I mean, are you running a three shift, four shift system? What are you, what are you planning to do? We currently run a two shift system, um, and you're absolutely right. One of the things we're looking at is to look with our staff and our trade union side about how we um, can extend capacity in on those lanes. Um, so currently, MOTs will, you know, you know, they've got a set number of hours. You know, we already had put because of the demand issues on. We have extra. Um, uh, uh, testers trained, we have Sunday opening, uh, all of those things were all in place. But you're absolutely right, what we are looking at now 
is how do we extend particularly that lane and how do we get maximum capacity on that lane. But we will need to work with our staff and with the trade union side to ensure that that is something we can. But you know, that is that is absolutely being looked at as we speak. Okay. This four four month extension is actually creating huge pressure for four months' time when it'll be doubling up. Yeah. So, in order, frankly, to get over this huge problem, this is a huge problem that the whole country has at the minute, which could see uh, 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 lots of vehicles uh, not legally on our roads uh, and huge inconvenience. So are you, what, what emergency, emergency legislation is required in order to extend the first year in which MOT is required and can that be moved quickly? And then the final question that I have is around the nature of the contracts. It was PFI type agreement that put all this equipment in. Um, what was the life guarantee with that PFI? Um, uh, there are repetitive movements as part of the testing process, testing, I suppose it's, it's ball joints and uh, uh, the track rod ends and all sorts of things. So there's this vibration, repetitive vibrationary movement, which almost obviously creates a stress and is likely to have contributed uh, to the failure and, and, the, and the, the cracks. So is it clear, is that a fault of the manufacturer uh, or is that a fault of not replacing uh, these heavily used components. And obviously, I would expect that to be a, a conversation with the supplier around all of that and about how we use the lifts and what their maintenance regime was doing and, and, and all of that. Um, I don't have with me, we can get obviously what the life of the existing lifts uh, are. On the legislative point and about extending, um, you'll appreciate that up until last night, uh, we had the four months extension in. In that four months extension, we were saying in order to manage demand that we potentially would pull through people earlier. So the, the thought process had been that get the situation under control, put the four month extension, temporary exemptions in, and if we can, in order to manage demand, bring people earlier in the four months to stagger. So we do, you're absolutely right to avoid a spike in four months' time. Um, that DBA would have been putting steps in to do that, and that was all part of it as well. Um, obviously, as of yesterday evening, it uh, has got escalated into a much larger volume issue and we will need to be looking to see, well, what does that mean? Um, at the moment, the priority has been on those who, whose MOTs are expiring today um, and resolving that. A lot of what you're describing, I wouldn't disagree with you in terms of things that we need to look at, but you'll appreciate between last night and this morning, uh, we haven't quite uh, got on top of all of that. You're, we, this is an unacceptable position, there is no doubt about it, um, and there are many layers to be worked through about options, about how we move this forward and get it back into control, and that's exactly where the Minister wants us to be. Uh, yes, review how this happened, but equally ensure this doesn't happen again, but also take steps to urgently get us back and safely get us back into normal operational mode which will include dealing with capacity issues because back to the points of earlier um, we have capacity uh, the demand is is high it will continue to be high through to our summertime which is the issues of last year um, we had put in place lots of steps to manage all of that um, and to increase capacity generally in the network um, um, and obviously we'll need to reflect on all of that now in terms of how do we, you know, what does all this mean when you, when you put and forecast um, uh, the, the demand further through the rest of the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I do welcome the assurances given in relation to the whole issue with regards to the reserves that DVA hold. I think that is assuring. But for me, um, I think it's important to know CPS question really whether there'll be an expiration or a compensation from the supplier. Because using the reserves to affect the repairs and or the replacements, um, those reserves are then going to end up having to be um, sort of topped up again. And um, from the line of questioning or the line of discussion around this would have been that the way to do that then would be to pass on the charge to motorists around that if we're not going to have a, a charge to the public purse in relation to that. So it's really whether there's going to be an expiration really in terms of compensation from the supplier. Um, I would also would agree with Mr Hilditch around the whole issue in relation to health and safety. The health and safety of staff 
and customers must be of paramount concern in all of this. And that must be the dominant factor. So whatever we do has to be about ensuring that the health and safety of staff and customers is of paramount concern and uh, going forward. Um, the other issue really related to that was that we were talking about eight weekly and six monthly inspections and whether those were inspections throughout the life of the contract or whether they've just been recently. Um, those have been, as I understand it, through the life, and there's been no change in those um, um, maintenance regimes, if you like, um, in, in recent times or anything that, that's been standard. Um, in, I, I couldn't agree more with the health and safety point. That is why we have taken all the lifts down rather than continuing to operate um, you know, some of them. Or, um, now we may be able to take a view on that uh, if we get more assurances on that, but as of last night, we took them all down all about health and safety, so completely in that space. In terms of discussions with supplier, and I think you've both raised the issues, in fact all of you nearly have, in terms of um, the, you know, who, what did they do, were they doing their jobs right, who's responsible for it, were we doing our jobs right, all of those questions are highly valid questions, and I expect those conversations <coughs> to continue, um, and we will be on those conversations, absolutely, um, something like this. You, you, you immediately need to turn to your contract with your supplier and establish the, whether they are fulfilling the duties within that contract or not, and therefore you, you follow the food and the, the, the train of thought there. So uh, we, will, we will absolutely do that, um, but obviously have not had the opportunity to follow that through. I think that's welcome, but I think it is important. We, there is an exploration really in relation to compensation, not just for the cost of the repairs or replacements, but also the inconvenience to motorists uh, around Northern Ireland, so it's something that's very important. But if that wasn't to be successful, obviously there's been talk about using the reserves to cover the cost of this, but um, would the thought be then if that had to occur, then how would we actually uh, bring the reserves back to the, the sufficient level in relation to that? Uh, we would initially look within DBA to establish what that would uh, mean. Um, I mean, at the, these lifts would have, uh, I don't want to sort of overplay that, because the lifts would have needed to be replaced at some point. They weren't going to last forever. Mm. So at some point they were going to have to be bought. This has just brought it into a very cold and urgent yeah. uh, position. Um, but those reserves would have been used to buy lifts at some point. Uh, it just may mean that they're being bought earlier than maybe would have been the case. Do we have an idea in terms of when the, we were in visit? Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, but um, you know, what we will need to ensure is that public, whether it's reserves or not, it's still public funds. It still needs to be done appropriately. Procurements have to be done properly uh, and public expenditure needs to be protected uh, at the same time as ensuring that we've got a fit for purpose service and that we're protecting our, our employees and our customers. And that's what we're trying to work through uh, very quickly and urgently at this point in time. Um, yeah. Just one last question. Obviously, there's a four-month extension that's uh, being granted. Uh, the concern is that, you know, what we talked about last summer in terms of the capacity of DVA, that, you know, the longer this goes on, days, weeks, essentially months, lists of people who are going to be needing to get uh, an MOT certificate is going to increase and uh, whether there's an ability within legislation to further extend that but also I have a concern around that because the more extensions we have obviously it's a mother's responsibility to ensure that their vehicle is roadworthy but there's a higher and higher and higher risk in terms of road safety in terms of vehicles being on the road uh, and uh, whether there's an ability to extend that but also that view in terms of that risk to road safety. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the road safety point cannot be lost in the middle of all of this. We need to ensure that our, our cars on the road are, are safe. So, in balancing up how quickly, you know, what what is the right and the most appropriate solution uh, to resolve it, um, and looking at the options on that, um, how quickly can that whatever that solution is be put in place, um, and then figuring out from that, well, what does that mean for capacity at a point? And therefore, what do we need on demand? And what do we potentially then need to do around anything and any levers that we might have um, to, to deal with a, a spike in demand at particular points? So um, that's, that's something that will become clearer as we work through those steps, which we will need to do very quickly, uh, very urgently. Um, to establish exactly that we are, when we are operational, that we have confidence that we will be able to meet the demand. In one way, the, uh, the events of last summer, um, it means we have already taken considerable extra steps to put in place extra uh, testers to uh, do the Sunday openings pretty routinely now. 
um, um, and actually, uh, you know, understand our forecasting and our demand models better. So some of that will actually help us in good stead about understanding um, if, uh, based on a period of time, what will then happen further down the track. But we need to do the work to enable us to then figure out, well, what will that mean for customers? How do we manage demand? And what are our options around doing that? And that's all work that is um, kicking off. Can the four months be extended? Um, I, don't, I don't want to actually answer that because my, 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 my logic says, well, I presume it can, but I, I don't want to promise that. Um, and that, you know, um, can you do I don't, There's There'll be legislative driven that, so I really don't want to, uh, to promise something that maybe is not possible to be done. Uh, but all I could assure the committee was we will be looking at all sorts of options. But your point is still valid. You can't extend them. You know, there's a road safety right. point within it too, and therefore you don't want to be um, yeah. extending for a, a long period of time either. So, but I can assure the committee we will be looking at it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyle. You want to come in just, on one of Just a wee quick one, Chair, because it's something the committee will have to look at. I, I do appreciate the rise mentioned, and the chair also mentioned. See the four-year rule in terms of maybe look, legislatively looking at the five years for one year, if you consider mm -hmm. that, because. That's counter. You're, you're trying to do all this in the four-month period to try and address that. Yep. You know, and we might, as a committee, might support for one more year extending the the, the year of the car for one year. But I just, as part of all that argument, there's going to be a financial impact on all that, and that would need to be brought to the table if we were to support it. It's just something. But I, looking at it, I think it's a way out for for the department, for for all of us, to give it one year's extension. To get over this, for even the four months rule, okay. but we need to just seriously look at the Absolutely. impact in terms of safety and all of that. So, thanks, Chair. Just want to make. Okay, that. Ms. Kimmel. Yeah, and thanks, Julie. I suppose it's been very helpful for a lot of us in terms of um, the tax and insurance one. That's one that we've all been hit on. So, <coughs> we're able to communicate that information out um, as quickly as possible. I think that will <coughs> really help because I don't think there has been anything out that's clear and 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 letting people know where they stand in relation to that. Just, I suppose, a quickly, cu couple of quick points, and it kind of uh, leads on from what Mr Buchanan and Mr Moore was saying there in relation to if, you know, if it is a fault in terms of manufacturing. Um, I suppose my concern would be going forward that, you know, because I suppose th this issue has all occurred nearly in such a short period of time, um, it, there's quite a high possibility that it has been an issue with <coughs> the equipment itself, and that's why, but we don't know that yet. Um, so going forward, will there be an investigation in terms of the standards of, of the inspection? Um, and additionally, then, should we be looking at, because you know, I know there will be a procurement process um, for replacements and things like that, but um, that's not to say that we won't be faced with something like this again. So should we be looking at the frequency of inspections for, for a, um, a period going forward to ensure that things are picked up? Much more quickly, <coughs> and as I said, it's not we're not hit with it all at once, so that it's, it's we a bit easier dealt with. So um. we we need to understand all of this mm -hmm. a, a lot better. Absolutely, um, I think the frequency, you know, how you set up a new contract, um, you know, who do you procure from, how do you run that procurement, um, how do you set up that contract. What do you do about maintenance and inspections? Uh, you know, and who should carry them out? And do you need secondary checks around all of that? I think all of that will need to be looked at. Um, Minister is absolutely um, um, very keen that we have a review to understand both what has happened here, uh, which will include um, considering the supplier angle on that, but obviously will include DBA as well. Um, and then to ensure that we have the right arrangements in place <coughs> to prevent it happening again. Um, so that is that is the course of action that we're on, and we just need to work our way through the various steps of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCartney. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I, I don't like to dwell on the practical what you're working through, but it, it just strikes me about you know like there could be a 20-year-old veil getting a four-month exemption, whereas a, a four-year-old you know it's, it, it seems. You know, it just seems a bit imponderable that you know you, you can't go for the year. But I, I can understand all your reasons. I don't want to go into that. But the, the thing that sort of strikes me about it is, is that the first fault w w was discovered in November, okay, and then you said on the 15th of January there there was 48. You know, I, I take it. You know, the 47 other ones it didn't happen on the 14th. Is there a trail, a, a direct trail? 
of when these were detected. I'm sure an inspector would say it was on the, you know, the, the, the 13th of November at 10.45. I was inspecting and found. So there, there will be a timeline between the 1st and the 40th. There, there absolutely will be. Yeah. Um, as the, as the, um, <coughs> and that period, I guess, is from you know, November into the early <coughs> part of January. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, and as the cracks are being identified, there's there, the supplier is still saying no, con, you know, no safety concerns. So to the, so to the points raised about uh, employees and, and protection and all of that, that was well, you know, understood um, and being worked through. Equally, repairs would also have been put being put in place, um, and in an operational environment, um, you know. Uh, equipment having faults needing to be repaired and whatever that's all part of, of doing the business uh, in any operational environment this has just ended up at a point where it has escalated in, in a way that had we've had no um, history of uh, and there and when your supplier is <coughs> you know as of last night we can't give you sufficient assurances that's where we've ended up um, in terms of the uh, inspection regimes, they were on inspections, they were being repaired, they were being reinspected. All of those things were, were being worked through. Um, um, but it escalates exceptionally quickly in a very, very short piece of time. And we need to understand why. Yeah, I, I can understand that, but I mean, 48, you know, it's somewhere along the line, it would strike me that there was a tipping point. It's the same, same lift, the same manufacturer, and same supplier. 48 seems to be a high number for you to declare it if you like an emergency. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you were uh, was any question asked at any time, uh, was there a fault in the same machine elsewhere uh, but that the supplier given to some other industry or some other equivalent agency? We need to look at that with the supplier. And I, 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 I know, I, I know, I, we, I know we have to look at it, but yeah. I'm asking, has it been looked at? Because this happened in November. Uh, that's the 15th of January. So it, they say we have to look at it. In, in my opinion, it isn't the answer which I'm looking for. I want someone to say, yes, we did. Because uh, if you were buying anything and you seen 48 faults, you know, if you bought a new car and, and there was 48 faults within a short period, you would be back to the supplier saying, that's not the car I bought and it's under warranty. Uh, so, therefore, that's why I'm asking that question. And, I completely understand yeah, yeah, the question, yeah. and I just personally can't answer it, but yeah. we can absolutely get you an answer about whether it has been asked to date. Absolutely. Yeah, and you see, on, on, in terms of the legal status, and this might sound a silly question, who owns the lifts? Is it the DVA? We've or, bought them, so there are lifts. The, you, yeah. They're your lifts, yeah. right, okay. Uh, the, and the, it's the supplier provides the inspector or the DVA? Supplier uh, subcontracts out both the maintenance and the inspecting. Yeah. Through a contract, so we have our contract is with the yeah. supplier, and they subcontract with yeah. repairs and the inspection, and the inspection is through an insurance company. Yeah. So, but no, without prejudice, perhaps that's something we could be looking at in terms of yep. the inspection. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I just I just noticed in the in the first day brief for the minister, and I, I, I'm not sure what she's going to say about it. But I, I, this wasn't flagged up on the first day brief. No, uh, is that a mistake? Um, this, the first day brief was done, what, around the 11th of the January? 11th of January, so yeah. somewhere in there. The report on the 48th of the 55 comes in on the 15th of January. See, see that's, that's why it's critical. Yeah. And I think it's something the committee will come back to. I, I would like to see the timeline, you know, because I, I have to say it would be nearly incredulous to believe that you find these all on the 14th of January. And if there's a steady timeline from November and into December and into January, then there will be more questions asked as to why this wasn't flagged up earlier and it, it didn't become an issue earlier. And, and again, back to, I absolutely accept that yeah. point and it obviously will need to be looked at. Um, the supplier, even on that 15th of January, was saying no concerns about those lifts, but um, I appreciate that the timeline yeah, needs to be looked at. I, I, I don't know who the supplier is, so I, don't, I, I, I yeah. say this without prejudice, but, uh, you know, do I, yeah. I would say that, wouldn't I? Like, no, I mean, that's, that's without prejudice. But you know, if there are, if there's other uh, instances that this is <coughs> happening, then, then it adds it. And we're asking questions some, somewhat in the blind. But you know, 48 lifts, you know, all cracked. You know, there, there, there's just something. There's a design fault or, or something. 
And if you have a timeline running from yeah. November into January, then I think people will ask questions as to why it wasn't flagged up earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Hilditch? Thanks, Chair. That mean again, just on the uh, communication that I'd mentioned earlier, uh, on another aspect of that, do you feel that the Department and DVA maybe acted in haste yesterday in relation to trying to get a good news story out for the Minister, but hence causing the Minister some embarrassment, considering there was going to be further very serious questions asked later in the day? Um, as we knew it, that's, that's where we were, we wanted to make sure that people knew that the temporary exemption certificate uh, process <coughs> that she had asked us to look at, that we had got that working, because it was really, really important for people to know that that procedure was going to give them protection and allow them to drive. Um, so we wanted to get that out to the public, and we wanted to also give respect to the assembly process and to make sure assembly, assembly colleagues were notified so about it as well. So the afternoon news then came as somewhat of a shock to you then? Uh, yesterday evening came as a big Good. shock. Yes. Okay. Thank what, you. What, what became a shock? The fact that the supplier said that they didn't have sufficient assurance over the repairs that were in place. It took them long enough, didn't it? Okay, Mr. Buchanan. Uh, but did they say what the nature? Are, they're, they're, are you saying now that the lifts are, can't be repaired? We don't know that. That's right. that's okay. part of the process. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, w what we will do, uh, and what I uh, I suspect where we're at, um, even as we speak, is about getting another assessment, independent assessment, yeah. of of the uh, of the position, so we understand exactly what we need. <coughs> to do next. Okay, Mr. Buchanan. Right, just on the supplier, obviously the supplier is dealing with. The 48 lifts here in Northern Ireland for, for, for use, okay? You told me earlier they're a worldwide supplier. Mm -hmm. So the worldwide industry is going to be saying, there's a problem with these lifts. Have you any concerns that the supplier could get to be in trouble? Or indeed, have they enough resources working on, on, or in your 48 lifts? Because no doubt England and Wales and Scotland, if there's lifts over there, whether well, it be in private garages or in centres or across worldwide, is this company going to be in any pressure? And is there a plan B in that? Because if the lifts across the world has now suddenly got a problem. That company can be a problem. Are you confident you've enough they have enough resources working on our 48 lifts? Well, our, our concentration is obviously in finding a solution that works for, for DBA. You're absolutely right. Are there wider ramifications which, we, which the supplier may have to work through? That's obviously for them to, to deal with. Um, the important thing is that we understand what our lifts are, uh, what are the options on our lifts, and what can we do about them. Um, is repair the answer? Is uh, replacement of parts the answer? Is purchase of new lifts the answer? That's the process we need to work through. Um, and then where does the supplier fit in, both backwards in terms of what has happened to date, and then forwards in terms of where we need to go for the future. Mm. All of that, all of that, I mean, uh, we, we, I couldn't agree more that needs to be looked at and needs to be very much um, worked through with the supplier with our interests and with our customers and employees' interests uh, at the heart of that. Julie, you're, you're talking here weeks, not days. Well, if we have to, I mean, uh, that was uh, on, on the uh, media this morning in terms of if we have to find that we have to buy new lifts uh, and that's the answer and then they have to be put into place, then that obviously, but in terms of exactly, it would be wrong of me to speculate exactly what is going to happen here because we just need to do the work. And I think it's appropriate that we, are, we do that. Uh, I can completely, completely understand all the committee's questions. Um, absolutely. Um, and we have to do the work now to get both you the answers, us the answers, minister the answers, um, and be able to, so having put steps in place to keep the operational side operating, we, we need to, to put the steps in place around how did we get here what does it mean for the supplier? Who's paying for it? All of those questions that you have asked, that's the course of action. And there's multiple channels of work that need to be very, very quickly moved forward on, and they will be. OK, thank yeah. you, Mr Beggs. Yeah, just, uh, uh, in terms of the, the failure of the cracks, is it the same component or the same small number of components that have failed repetitively over the whole uh, list? And as such, is it a matter of re potentially replacing individual components rather than going through a six months procurement exercise for a new supply of lifts? lifts. So, so will you be ensuring that we look for short term as well as long term solutions uh, there? We will be looking at all options, absolutely, because uh, what, what we don't want to do, mind you, is to act to do something which then um, 
you know, yeah. doesn't last or whatever. So we do need to find something that, that is workable and that is a good use of public funds and that provides an effective service. So, but we will be absolutely looking at both short term and long term. And so you said it's the same component know. that's going It's on the scissor arms of the lift. Yeah, the cracks are on the, on the scissor arms of the lift. Okay, thank you. Any other members wish to ask any further questions at this stage on this item? Chair, Chair, just to remember, it's, it's public money on their public lifts. I appreciate contract and subcontract, but at the end of the day, there are lifts, and we have a responsibility to make sure that every pound been spent on safe for the workers and everybody yes, else. Safety. That's the most safety. important thing. I, I appreciate the, the issue, that, and there's going to be questions over subcontract and contracts and, and procurement and all of that. You know? Safety. Totally. I couldn't okay. agree more. Thank you. Um, we'll obviously be returning to this many times over the next number of weeks and perhaps months um, until this is brought to a conclusion. So thank you very much, Julie, for for, for taking questions on that on that item, which is incredibly topical. Um, to go back then to um, what we had intended this this session to be in relation to, which was an overview of the department. Yep. Um, I'm not sure whether each of you wanted to maybe give a short synopsis of 